Asia Pacific, Dr. Sri Mohammed Iqbal Rauta, advisor and chairman of the Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur. Dr. Doan Doi Kong, Chairman ASEAN Business Advisory Council. Your Excellencies, organizers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this moment to probably bring us to a little bit of a broader perspective of ASEAN and the role that ASEAN has played over the last six decades or so, and the role that ASEAN should play moving ahead. The impact of COVID-19 and the new norm has come to stay. There is no question about that. Moving forward, we need to put our differences aside and work as one. ASEAN has shown the greatest possible promise. It was begun on the basis of a premise that we will stand against the world. Individually, the countries of ASEAN are not economically capable of taking on any of the trading blocks across the world. However, when we come together, ASEAN is a formidable adversary indeed, and a trading block that the world will have to consider. We have the fastest growing youth base. We have close to 600, in a population of 650 million people, we have close to 213 million youth. And that is nothing to be sneered at. We are one of the fastest digital growing populations in the world. And the fact of the matter is ASEAN was begun so that we could hedge our bets against the flow of the political forces around the planet. China is in our backyard, so to speak, or we actually are in their backyard. The United States has always been a force by itself. EU stands on its own. ASEAN will only work when we come together. And the thing that we need to do is, I think first and foremost, is to bring the various divisions within ASEAN to an end. Bringing ASEAN closer together is our only real hope. There is a north-south divide, clearly, in ASEAN. There always has been. And essentially, the countries in the north are connected historically, culturally, linguistically, and the countries in the south, south of the uh, peninsula, so to speak, are also connected in the same manner. This divide, however, is something that the Thai-Malaysian border is best representative of. Malaysia and Thailand have been always the two unique forces that can bring the divide to work together. And the hope that Malaysia and Thailand bring is the future of ASEAN will actually work. It will be functional. At the Malaysian-Thai border, which is the actual land bridge in between the north and south of ASEAN, we have communities that speak languages on both sides, understand the cultures on both sides, and basically that's where hope springs eternal that ASEAN can actually work together. So moving forward, we need to think in terms of how we can bring the barriers down. The, the new norm is not going to be any different from the old norm, so to speak. The new norm, in essence, it will only work if we bring down the barriers. And this I'm referring to the tariff barriers, the border controls, recognizing each other's uh, skill sets, free movement of labor, and, and all of that. Malaysia and Thailand represent the real hope of this happening. If Malaysia and Thailand actually prove to be a working collaboration, then the rest of ASEAN will follow suit. There was at one point in time a proposition that the four northern states of Malaysia and the southern provinces of Thailand have a special economic zone. I've always considered that a very bold initiative, something that could really work in favor, not just of Malaysia and Thailand, but the whole of ASEAN, so to speak. Both of these regions are, in a sense, economically depressed and the hope that the borders opening up and creating a special economic zone somewhat in the fashion of Shenzhen in China would create a flow of movement of ideas 
of goods and services, of energies across the borders, the tariffs, making possible the other divisions in ASEAN coming down, so to speak. The potential of ASEAN has always been limited by a lack of digital skills. Now, digital skills are not something that um, we can force feed or create. It has to begin organically and grow organically. And the COVID-19 approach, the COVID-19 environment actually has fostered this. There have been tremendous growth in terms of digital skills, particularly across the youth in ASEAN. And the future relies on how these digital skills will bring us together. Now, the governments could work together for the ASEAN youth has demonstrated abilities to adapt to these new challenges by significantly increasing digital adoption, learning new skills, thinking creatively and developing new business models. Ultimately, ASEAN has been possible and has grown because of entrepreneurship. Now it is the new frontier, the digital frontier that represents the new area where, front, where entrepreneurship could potentially grow and foster. We have given birth to some major digital organizations in this region. And the region is really what we need to be thinking about, as opposed to be thinking about us individually as nations. If we think about us as a region, then there is real hope for the future moving ahead. Having said that, in the words of someone I rarely quote, President Trump, who has always gone about saying, America first. I would like to, to leave this conference with a different statement, simply saying, if we start by saying ASEAN first, then ASEAN will truly have a future and ASEAN will be a viable future for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yang Bahagia, Dr. Suri, Dr. Vijay S. Warren, for giving us an inspiring speech and a big thanks to the QI Group for being the title sponsors for this year's forum. Next, we would like to welcome Dr. Don Dui Kong, Chairman of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council of Vietnam and Chairman of the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who will be delivering his opening speech. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Dato Sri Mustafa bin Mohammed, Minister in the Prime Minister Minister Department, Malaysia. The Honorable Dato Sri Jaya Hajimot, Yusuf, Minister Foreign Affairs, Brunei Darussalam. Your Excellency, Dr. Tan Myun, Union Minister for Commerce, Myanmar. Tan Sri Michael Iho, Photo and Chairman ASEAN Leadership and Partnership Forum, President KSI for Asia Pacific. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kung, the Chair of ASEAN Bank. Thank you for having me in this virtual forum in the changing world. Yes, it is natural that our world does change. No matter we want it or not, one can look at how the digital economy and the COVID-19 changed the way we live and we work and so on and so forth. Furthermore, the changes generate both chance and challenge. We can look at the COVID-19, for instance. The pandemic has already severely affected the global economy. On the other hand, COVID-19 also has accelerated the adoption of the digital culture worldwide. That is why our world can be described as triple C world. Triple C, that stands for change, change, chance, and challenge. Taking the fact in today's meeting, I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on what are happening to ASEAN and our opportunity and challenge, and also to update you with some ASEAN BAC activities in the time to come. Number one, current situation. Now, in all countries across ASEAN, the pandemic has caused the loss of people life and disrupted production, diminished demand for many goods and services, broken supply chains, and forced enterprises to suspend 
or scale down of variations. Therefore, ASEAN is coping with two tasks, to save our life and to overcome the economic crisis. Number two, I would like to share with you some opportunity and challenges in the development of digital ASEAN in the current situation. ASEAN inherited a good platform for digital ASEAN economy. ASEAN is a challenging market, but it is also attractive to entrepreneurs and reformers. As a reason, currently the third largest market in Asia after China and India, and it is home to 650 million people, many of whom are increasingly wealthy. ASEAN is also a young market with 60% of population under 35 years old. This demographic platform increases the force of technology savvy people and the demand to access to information via mobile devices. However, there are many constraints in our road since ASEAN is very diversified and there are big gaps across ASEAN countries. ASEAN seem to be more diversified if we do not have our immediate solution and appropriate strategy to address the challenges. Number three, I would like to come up with some kind of our action plans with the digital ASEAN. Ladies and gentlemen, by 2030, ASEAN will have the fourth largest economy in the world with a forecasted population of 720 million people and an expected GDP of 7 trillion US dollars. We are convinced that digital economy is one of the best way to help ASEAN stay healthy and productive. As a result, ASEAN has laid out important policy measures and frameworks, including the AEC Blueprint 2025. Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025, and the E-ASEAN Framework Agreement in which there are regional digitalization is a key. In this year, 2020, under the Vietnam Chairmanship, taking this opportunity, I would like to introduce to you three main activities of ASEAN BAC we carry out in the accordance with the digital ASEAN development within this year. Number one, ASEAN Biz, ASEAN Business and Investment Summit. The main theme of the coming ASEAN Biz is digital ASEAN, sustainable and inclusive. We expect to discuss in the event four topics. Number one, the common ASEAN data policy. We like to, to shape a common regional data policy. It means we have to shape some kind of best practices on data classification in a formal process of inputs. Number two, ASEAN digital skills. We are going to build a shared commitment to train digital skills for ASEAN workforce. Number three, ASEAN e-commerce and e-payments. We are going to build an e-commerce platform and some also build a common ASEAN e-payment framework. Number four, ASEAN cybersecurity. We are going to discuss about how we develop the cooperation and capacity building in ASEAN cybersecurity. And now, legacy project. As you may know that each year, ASEAN Bank has at least one legacy project initiated by ASEAN Bank host country. This year, 2020, ASEAN Bank Vietnam is working on the digital stars. It stands for digital startups towards ASEAN resilience and sustainability. Outputs of digital stars 2020 can be described in three deliverables. One, ASEAN network for sharing the best practice of digital startups. Those provide digital transformation solution in entering markets and fundraising for growing and scaling up in the region. Two, policy recommendation on facilitating digital transformation in ASEAN. Number three, introduction 
of innovative, affordable, and available digital transformation tra solution to MSMEs in ASEAN. And now, the establishment of HLSC. As you may know that the digitalization process accelerated by the pandemic, it will be changed definitely the way we work in ASEAN. Consequently, in the last 36 summit in June, ASEAN Bank has urged the leaders to set up the high level special commission of ASEAN that will be supported by a special business advisory board. The initiative has been supported by some leaders of ASEAN. However, no matter that this proposal would be welcome or not, this point here is that we need to look for new working mechanism instead of the tra traditional way of slowly doing things in our leadership with the extensive adoptions of digital technology in the faster changing world with both opportunity and challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to conclude my remarks here and look forward to cooperate with all of you in the above activities of ASEAN Bank to realize the digital ASEAN economy. Hence, it is to make ASEAN truly cohesive and responsive in the Triple C world, Triple C region. I wish the forum a success and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Doing Doi Kung, for your opening speech. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, next I would like to invite Yang Bahagia Tan Sui, Dr. Michael Yo, founder and chairman of the ASEAN Leadership and Partnership Forum, to deliver his welcome speech and to make a special announcement for this year's recipient of the ASEAN Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award. Tan Sui. His Excellency, Dr. Tan Min, Minister of Commerce, Union of Myanmar, His Excellency, Dr. Sri Haji Area One, Second Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Brunei Darussalam, His Excellency, Dr. Tung Tai Kun, Chairman, ASEAN Business Advisory Council, Ambassador Dr. Ahmad Rozian, Director General, ASEAN Malaysia, Wisma Putra, Dr. Sri Mohammad Iqbal, Dr. Sri Vijay Eswaran, Mr. Kuna Sanati Raja, Group Managing Director of the QI Group, Excellencies, Dato Dato, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted and honored to welcome all of you to the ASEAN Leadership and Partnership Forum. First, I've been asked by Yang Boma Dato Sri Mustafa Muhammad, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, to convey his greetings to all of you, but to also convey his apologies that he has been asked to remain in Parliament this afternoon to attend to some very urgent matters as today is the last day of the Parliament sitting. But we are also delighted to be able to have with us virtually the ministers from Brunei Darussalam and Myanmar who will be addressing us virtually in a short while. Our ASEAN Leadership and Partnership Forum is held for the first time as a hybrid event with a physical presence plus a virtual forum online. So let me welcome all of the many speakers and participants who are zooming in on us today and tomorrow morning. This forum was initially supposed to be held in, conjun in conjunction with the ASEAN Summit in Da Nang in April this year as it has always been our past to have this conference as one of the events towards the end of the April ASEAN Summit. And then when we discussed with ASEAN back and with the Chairman Dr. Dun, we had also planned to have this forum in Hanoi in conjunction with the ASEAN Economic Ministers Meeting, which is taking place this week was supposed to have taken place this week in Hanoi, but because of the COVID pandemic, this has to be changed into a virtual ministerial meeting, and hence we are doing this forum in a hybrid form with a physical 
forum and a hybrid forum. Let me also thank all our many speakers who are speaking virtually from other countries, particularly those who are joining us from Australia, Japan, Hong Kong, and the USA. I must thank His Excellency Dr. Duan Tai Kuang and the ASEAN Business Advisory Council for the support that ASEAN Bank has extended to us in organizing this forum. A very big thank you also to Dr. Sri Vijay Swaran and the QI Group for once again being the title sponsor for today's forum. And I must also acknowledge and thank the Quark Group as well as the Bajaya Group for the support of this forum. I wish to congratulate Vietnam for the chairmanship of ASEAN this year. And although most of the meetings have been held virtually, nevertheless, the theme adopted by Vietnam, a cohesive and responsive ASEAN is indeed apt and relevant with the COVID pandemic and many other challenges facing ASEAN. We wish to also commend ASEAN back for the digital ASEAN initiatives that it is implementing for ASEAN's digitalization to have an inclusive and sustainable digital ASEAN economy. COVID-19 has required ASEAN to enhance its cohesiveness to strengthen regional cooperation, particularly in public health care and economic cooperation. As the region grapples with this twin challenge of health and economy and lives and livelihood. But for a long time, ASEAN has been characterized by the four C's, the ASEAN community, charter, connectivity, and centrality. We should discuss how we can make these four C's of ASEAN more responsive and effective as ASEAN moves forward in the years ahead. The business community also hopes that RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, can be signed and concluded this year. At the same time, I think all of us would like to see the ASEAN countries and China moving forward to agree and conclude the negotiations for the Code of Conduct on the South China Sea. This forum that we are organizing brings together representatives from government, business, and civil society. And it is important that we also include civil society in the discussions on the future of ASEAN. Tomorrow, we will have many CSOs from Philippines, from Indonesia, and from around the region who will be participating in the forum virtually. And I look forward to their contributions, particularly those from women and youth groups. I must also acknowledge and thank Ambassador Michael McCulloch of the US ASEAN Business Council, Ambassador Masataka Fujita, Secretary General of the ASEAN Japan Center, as well as our many thought and CSO leaders who will be speaking virtually tomorrow. We hope the discussions at the forum can provide useful inputs to ASEAN leaders and the ASEAN Secretariat. And as we do every year, we will be sub submitting a report of the proceedings to the ASEAN Secretary General. Ladies and gentlemen, every year at the forum, we honor a distinguished ASEAN business leader with a distinguished lifetime achievement award. Last year, we had the opportunity to convey this Lifetime Achievement Award on our previous speaker, Mr. Goping Wei, the founder and chairman of the Civil Lake Group. And this year, we are delighted to confer the Lifetime Achievement Award on Dr. Stephen Riadi, a prominent business leader and property developer from Indonesia with extensive regional businesses in Singapore, Indonesia, and Hong Kong. In view of the travel restrictions, Dr. Reddy is not able to be here with us physically to receive this award. So we would be sending the award to him uh, shortly. 
congratulations to Dr. Stephen Riadi. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Tan Sri. And congratulations to Dr. Stephen Riadi for yet another noteworthy accomplishment. Now I'd like to invite Yamba Bahagia, Dr. Sri Muhammad Iqbal Rakta, advisor of KSI and chairman of the Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur to give his introductory remarks. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you once again. Uh, I'm very privileged to be saying at this inaugural session some welcome or introductory remarks for which I want to thank KSI for this opportunity given. Uh, I think this is a very highly protocoled uh, inaugural session, so I better be a little bit formal by uh, thanking the dignitaries, Dato Sri Dr. Vijay Iswaran, uh, Dr. Don Doi Kong, and of course, Tan Sri Michael Yo, and the Honorable Dato Sri Sitiya Haji Iriawan bin Pehin Dato Perkermajaya Haji Muhammad Yusuf, and His Excellency Dr. Tan Maid. Your Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, I also want to recognize the presence of uh, Dato Ahmad Rozian, Director General of ASEAN Malaysia National Secretariat. And I would like to convey my congratulations to Dr. Stephen Reddy, Executive Chairman and Group Chief Executive Officer of OUE Limited, for getting this Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award for property entrepreneurship. It's uh, a bit difficult during a pandemic period to organize a great event like this, especially when you are promoting ASEAN leadership and partnership. But pandemic or otherwise, we have to move forward with our agenda. Nothing comes to a grinding halt we have to take actions, actions as may be necessary in order to propel our objectives forward. Nothing is going to stop us. I think this is the global challenge that is being faced. And in particular in the ASEAN, we have had the demonstration of such good leadership. And uh, Malaysia, of course, I don't want to brag for Malaysia, is picked out as one of the countries showing leadership in containing the pandemic in a good way so that we are even fortunate to have a summit or a forum like this ongoing, albeit wearing face masks. As it is often said, ASEAN is a very unique example. There is nothing comparable, whether you compare with EU or any other regional organization. ASEAN is very unique. It has moved forward with some brilliance in some ways and also shortcomings in other ways. And leadership forum like this is actually designed to bring forward some other positive factors which can propel the ASEAN into a much more robust region of the world. I think it was said earlier by Tansri, uh, Datusri Vijay Iswaran that we are going to be like the fourth largest. At the moment, we are the sixth largest economy, 620 million people. And out of that, nearly one third is youth. These are good basic structural factors which have to be used in order to energize the region. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Dato Ahmad Rozian would be able to tell us a little bit more if given an opportunity to see how this is actually taking shape in uh, reality. But 
no doubt we have the potential, but the problem is that immediately we are facing the pandemic. We have to overcome, and in order to overcome by member countries, only then the potential can be very greatly realized. In June this year, the Hanoi Plan of Action was agreed to by the ASEAN Economic Ministers. I think they had a virtual meeting and they agreed on how we could revive the economy under pandemic conditions. And before that, on April the 14th, a virtual meeting was held also among the ASEAN leaders and a special ASEAN summit. And I would like just to highlight one or two or three points out of that meeting, which makes sense for the downside country agencies and the other frontier people in order to boost the economy, not only the ASEAN member states, but the ASEAN as a whole. First, priority to mitigate the impact of coronavirus, collective action. Although the border reopening has not been fully restored or even started in some cases, it would no doubt come into the fact as a result of this enunciation of this objective. Supply chain disruption has been very, very bad at the initial stages in March when the lockdowns came, supply chain disruptions, both consumer as well as industrial goods. Uh, this, you'll find that the reorganization of the supply chain and particularly the emergence of certain degree of digitalization making the move, moving of goods by way of digital agencies and so on has been very good as the earlier digital economy uh, panel session showed to us. Essential goods and food security is an important aspect because ASEAN is actually a good producer of food. And if only this could be encouraged and shared among the ASEAN countries, even the export potential would be very much great. And I agree with Tansri Michael Liu when he said that the RCEP will have to be concluded and post condomic post-corona kind of pandemic situation will encourage us to move forward in the trade and investment areas. And finally, I would like to emphasize that our priority has always been on trade and investment, and this is going to be a continuing priority, and hopefully tomorrow's sessions would be able to contribute some interactive discussions which would be able to provide a sort of an uh, uh, suggestions to the ASEAN Secretariat and to the leaders of the ASEAN Summit. With that, I would like to once again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and to all of you, happy listening to this today and also tomorrow for braving the, the, the pandemic situation and coming in one block to enhance the presence of this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato Siri, for your introductory remarks. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we will now be having the special ministerial addresses. It gives me great pleasure to invite His Excellency, the Honorable Dato Siri Satya Haji Irwan bin Tihin Datu Pakrama Jaya Haji Muhammad Yusuf, Second Minister of Foreign Affairs, Brunei Darussalam. Um, apologies, ladies and gentlemen, the minister can only speak at 4.15. There was a time that he has committed to address us, so we have a little time in between. Uh, we hope we can be patient to, to... Brunei now, is it? Uh, okay, he's now able to be online, that's fine. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, allow me to begin by personally thanking Tan Sri Michael Yeo for the invitation this afternoon. I would, I, I would also like to warmly congratulate colleagues from the KSI Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, and the Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur, among others, on their invitation, on their initiative to hold this event. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to join you all this afternoon. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me just bring you back to the history of ASEAN and why we've been able to develop compared to the other region. It is widely acknowledged that ASEAN has made remarkable progress and achievements over the years. ASEAN's history is well known. For over 50 years, ASEAN's work has touched millions of lives, lifting many out of poverty and ushering in decades of prosperity and development. Most importantly, ASEAN has created a regional community. Of course, all this success could not have been possible without regional peace and stability. It is this last point that the ASEAN's founding fathers knew very well. That is why agreements like the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, the Zone of Peace and Freedom and Neutrality, and the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone were the main focus of ASEAN's earlier work and continue to be until this day. To sum it up, ASEAN was less concerned about engaging in military conflicts, but more determined to build up confidence between countries to avoid conflicts. This is the fundamental belief which still holds true until today. And it is more important than ever as the world enters a new and uncertain era. Essentially, we are standing on the edge, looking into darkness, but determined to move forward for our shared future. Indeed, every generation has its problems and the challenges of today are not the same as the last. They have become more complex, more interconnected, and more impactful. Major power rivalries are now entering a new phase. Multilateralism and key institutions like the United Nations, the WTO, and even the WHO, which have served us well in the past, are now under pressure to be unraveled. Existential threats like climate change has even been described as a hoax by some, and others have not even taken it very seriously. Meanwhile, the fourth industrial revolution has had transformational changes, bringing new opportunities, but also severe anxieties. The same can be said on the COVID-19 pandemic, where health security, lives, and livelihoods are questioned, and even uncertainty in the maritime domain, where peace and security, especially in the South China Sea, which is vital for more than half of the world's trade, becomes contentious. So like I said before, we are on the edge. And where do we go from here? First, we must recognize where we are. ASEAN admittedly has been working in silos. Political, security, economic, and social cultural pillars, all with their own sectors, agendas, and processes. If we are going to overcome a crisis such as this pandemic, climate change, or maritime insecurity, we must move away from this archaic way of doing things. This brings me to another point, partnership. Ultimately, ASEAN's ability to overcome such challenges is not determined by the strength of its member states' military, but its diplomacy and most of all, its shared commitment to cooperation 
for regional peace, security, and prosperity. Rather than take sides or become a proxy in major power in rivalries, ASEAN has united its members in addressing issues of common concern. Obviously, many of the challenges facing countries in the region cannot be resolved by ASEAN alone. Addressing them requires unity and solidarity, and most of all, it demands solid partnerships. As the backbone of this region, ASEAN should demonstrate strong leadership as the central point for cooperation between countries in Southeast Asia and beyond. ASEAN's platform should be used to promote constructive engagement between countries, including major powers. At the same time, ASEAN should also work with partners in other multilateral institutions to mobilize like-minded countries to action. Brunei Darussalam will continue to be committed to working with fellow ASEAN member states and external partners to achieve this. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that COVID-19 pandemic is this generation's single most challenging crisis to date. The pandemic threatens to bring about the worst global recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Avoiding this demands that ASEAN immediately enact a swift and sustainable regional recovery plan. And above all else, our own history of over 50 years has taught us that prosperity and development requires a peaceful and stable regional platform. Therefore, the question we must consider is how can the private sector also help ASEAN ensure peace and stability that it has so greatly benefited over the years. On this, I would like to highlight four areas. First, we need to invest and do more business in each other's country. Together, businesses and investors will create a network within the region binding our countries much closer together. To make this work, we need to take advantage of the open economic policies, which enable the free flow of goods, services, and investment. Only then, ASEAN could truly increase intra-ASEAN trade and investment, building up the region's long-term resilience to external shocks. Second, rather than competing with each other, businesses and industries must complement one another. This is all about extending production bases within the region so that we enhance our collective competitiveness. We also need to expand our, shop, our supply chains within the region as well as strengthen them with external partners. Third, we must embrace the vibrant and natural development of sub-regions such as Bimpiaga. These areas, rich in strategic resources, have great potential for investment and development that could drive not only national development and growth, but also region-wide growth. Finally, governments too have their role to play. ASEAN member states must faithfully implement their commitments to all regional agreements. This is especially true for the action lines for each of the blueprints under the ASEAN Community Vision 2025. Conventional wisdom tells us that the collective success of ASEAN would be more valuable in the long term compared to the gains of individual states alone. We should therefore realize that working collectively and prospering together is a way to ensure continued security. As we enter a decade of uncertainty, this collective approach where no one is left behind should be the ASEAN way. With all this in mind, leadership and partnership are, are qualities that are vital for ASEAN in the many years to come. And the strength of ASEAN is greater than the sum of its member states. With that, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and thank you to you all.
Thank you, Honorable Dato Siri Satya Haji Erwan bin Pihin, Dato Prakarma Jaya Haji Muhammad Yusuf, for a very insightful special ministerial address. Next, it's my pleasure to invite His Excellency Dr. Tan Min, Union, Union Minister for Commerce of Myanmar, to give his special ministerial address. His Excellency, from ASEAN member countries, my you are on government, business, think tanks, civil society, Gurmia, and the media. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good day to you all. It's a great pleasure and honor to attend this 2020 ASEAN Leadership and Partnership Forum and Virtual Conference convened in conjunction with the ASEAN Economic Minister meeting together with you all and to deliver the address. On behalf of the government of Myanmar, I'm very pleased to be a particular contributor and extend my one congratulations to the government and the people of Malaysia, a PSN strategic institute for Asia Space and ASEAN Business Advisory Council, Vienna Institute for Economic and Policy Research for organizing this auspicious, uh, auspicious occasion. Distinguished technically ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN is a geopolitically situated right in the middle of the to ocean, India Ocean and Pacific Ocean, which are militarily and commercially important and thus plays a significant role to complementing and promoting intra-regional as well as inter-regional connectivity. Under the themes of cohesive and responsive ASEAN in 2020, we accentuate the need to enhance ASEAN unity, cooperation, and solidarity, and economic integration, ASEAN awareness, and identity, and emphasize the importance of promoting ASEAN pro-attentiveness and capacity, incising opportunity as well as in addressing the challenges brought about by the big changing in the regional and global landscape. COVID-19 global pandemic may have slowed down the work on upgrading ASEAN's various FTAs. We decide to redouble the efforts and ensure that ASEAN FTAs incorporated mechanism and for the export flows of supply chains and continue to deliver to new opportunities to business, especially the vulnerable groups. MSMEs, creative artists, and business startups, and in those times of global economic uncertainty due to the growth of pyramids. Therefore, the 26th ASEAN Summit recognized the indispensable roles of digital technology in recovery efforts. This recent concludes Recently conclude 2019 ASEAN Community Leadership and Partnership Forum also highlighted that ASEAN can see a need to work together to unleash the potential of technology to develop the digital economy, create a new business opportunity, and uh, put the expand the regional growth. Distinguished technology, ladies and gentlemen. ASEAN is a key global economy, but not yet a key digital economy. Digital integration is critical for the region to compete with other major uh, economies. Therefore, we ASEAN member states recognize the importance of cybersecurity cooperation in ensuring the ensuring the open, secure, stable, safe, well, and resilient cyberspace to spoof the ASEAN digital economy. However, we acknowledge that not only is a pool of government efforts for ASEAN member states, but also a pool of community approach is important 
increased opportunity in the digital age. They are enhancing vulnerability and promoting intra ASEAN trade and investment. I'm really glad this ASEAN leadership and partnership forum will be an important milestone for addressing the challenges of the COVID 19 pandemic and developing ASEAN not only as a resilient, cohesive, and responsive ASEAN, ASEAN but also a key digital economy through fruitful discussion among leaders from government, business, think tanks, and civil society. Distinguished dignity, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that regional cooperation cannot succeed with political commitment alone, a profound understanding of the pluralistic values of the region is also necessary. I'm confident that people in the ASEAN regions are capable of addressing global economic challenges, achieving the goal based on their historical legacy. Collaborations and cooperation between the countries in the region will enable all to create ASEAN as an environment conducive to peace and development more efficiently. Thank you all.